I'm sorry. Uh, I was muted and didn't realize it. So I'm going to start again on behalf of the Center for American Progress. I am thrilled to welcome you to today's conversation on the state momentum for paid leave alongside our co-hosts at the National Partnership for Women and Families. Paid family and medical leave is critical to the health of our country, the financial security of our families, and the growth of our economy. The benefits of paid leave for workers and their families is clear. No one should have to worry about their income when welcoming a new child or caring for a sick loved one or holding the hand of a parent in their final days. And paid leave also ensures workers are able to care for themselves when ill, allowing people to recover and return to the workforce once able to do so instead of suffering on the job or further risking their own health and often the health of coworkers. There's also a business case for paid leave. Studies have shown time and time again that paid leave helps retain employees and increases their productivity. And an affordable paid leave program can help to actually level the playing field for small businesses. While larger companies may be able to offer comprehensive benefits, smaller businesses and startups often struggle to do so. And affordable paid leave programs can help those growing businesses compete to attract top talent. Despite these clear benefits, there is currently no national law yet guaranteeing the right to any paid leave, making the United States an unfortunate outlier uh, with respect to the rest of the world. But as work continues to codify this benefit at the federal level, we are far from giving up. States across the country have led the way, stepping up to invest in their workers and employers. And I am so excited that we're focusing on states today for this reason. 11 states in the District of Columbia have already passed paid family and medical leave laws. More are poised to do so, including some states represented here this afternoon. I know we're all looking forward to hearing the insights from these leaders today. And to get us started, I am pleased, thrilled even, to introduce our first set of speakers. Jocelyn Fry is the president of the National Partnership for Women and Families, where she leads a wide range of work to advance economic justice, affordable and equitable health care, civil rights, and reproductive freedom for people and families across the country. I'm particularly pleased to welcome Jocelyn, given uh, we consider her one of us here at CAP, um, forever in the family. She's had, she had a long tenure as a senior fellow here at Center for American Progress and was one of the founders of our women's initiative. Uh, previously, Jocelyn also served, put that secondarily in the Obama administration as a deputy assistant to the president and director of policy and special projects for First Lady Michelle Obama. But she really is a member of uh, the CAP family. So very excited to have her here with us today. Jocelyn is joined by Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan of Minnesota and is just some of the highlights of the Lieutenant Governor's work while in office. She has led the governor's office efforts to increase the Minnesota Family Investment Program payments, payments and secure historic investments in affordable housing and childcare. Uh, a lifelong advocate for children, working fami families and communities of color and indigenous communities, the Lieutenant Governor previously served as Executive Director of the Children's Defense Fund Minnesota and trained thousands of advocates and elected officials through Wellstone Action. Lieutenant Governor Flanagan is also currently the country's highest ranking native woman elected uh, to an executive office. So thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation. And thank you, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and Jocelyn uh, Fry as well. And over to you, Jocelyn. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, it is great to be here. I appreciate your very generous introduction, and it does indeed feel a little bit like coming home uh, to be here with the rest of the CAP family um, uh, with my new hat at the National Partnership. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, what a pleasure it is to chat with you today. And I want to get right into the conversation because there are a number of things that I, I want to speak with you about and speak with you about your leadership on, on paid leave and so many issues related to caregiving. And I want to start with just a, a general question about why is paid leave important to you? What is it um, in your own personal experience that um, makes you think that it is important to focus on caregiving and, and care supports? Sure. Well, I'm so happy to be here uh, with you, Jocelyn, and uh, with Cap to talk about one of my favorite things, which is paid family and, and medical leave. Um, you know, this is a really personal issue for me. And I think 
uh, if all of us would take a moment uh, to reflect in how we came into this world and the people that we care for, the people that we love, um, I think all of us can find that personal connection uh, to, to this issue. I am a mom of a 10-year-old, uh, newly minted 10-year-old uh, girl, and I can't believe uh, how quickly uh, time has flown since she was born. But, uh, you know, this I've been fighting for paid family and medical leave this entire decade. Um, as a, a new mom, I needed it. I relied on it. Um, I had preeclampsia when I was pregnant with my daughter and was on bed rest for several weeks. I was fortunate to have an employer who provided that uh, for me and then was able to take uh, six weeks with my daughter after she was born for that just critical bonding and, and really um, important time for, uh, for her development and just no how much it means, um, how important it is to child development um, and, and bonding. And, you know, I think we know, though, that for too, too many families, for too many parents, um, taking that time off is, is not optional. And uh, I think, you know, particularly for women, women of color, indigenous women, uh, low-income folks, uh, this is not available to them, and they're forced to choose between their their family um, and their health and their financial stability. And and frankly, um, we shouldn't have to make that choice. And I think we feel the momentum in this moment of uh, becoming uh, a country, or at least state by state where paid family and medical leave uh, will simply be the law of the land and our expectation as it should be. You know, I, I appreciate um, uh, your uh, perspective because it always strikes me that, you know, so many people come to this issue through a personal story and a, and a personal experience. And uh, you, you leaned into sort of where I wanted to go next, which is that I know you and Governor Tim Walz have made this a priority in your state. Um, and it is around your point that there's so many folks who have care needs and really don't want to make these choices between care and work and, and their family. And can you talk a little bit about why paid leave is, and comprehensive paid leave has been a priority for your administration and how you've gone about approaching it in the state? Sure. So, you know, our goal and our sort of North Star is to make sure that Minnesota is the best place in the country to raise a family. And so paid family and medical leave is a really critical part of, of that foundation. Uh, it has been something that's been part of our agenda for in our first term for our first uh, four years. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned before, something that I had been fighting for as an advocate um, uh, in my role with Children's Defense Fund, and then as a legislator, and now as Lieutenant Governor. Um, and so we've been in it, right? We've kept the faith. As, as you know, knowing that this will be a possibility. And now um, we have the very unique um, uh, experience of being uh, a, a state where um, we have a trifecta, where uh, Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. And um, I would argue people who share our values around investing in children and families um, you know, are, are at the, the leadership helm in, in each one of these bodies. And so it's time has come. Uh, and I think we have been able to build um, a really, uh, I think, compelling um, coalition of folks through nonprofit organizations, um, child advocacy organizations, but also a, a pretty significant number of small business owners who say, this is really important for us to be competitive. We're the home of uh, several Fortune 500 companies here in Minnesota who offer paid family and medical leave because they know that it is appealing. It makes them competitive. And especially for this workforce and the emerging workforce, this is an expectation um, that people have. So I think there's been a lot of organizing work, a lot of personal stories that have been shared. Um, and to be really candid, uh, uh, a new group of of legislators, frankly, the most diverse group of of legislators who are just elected in this this most recent class are um, 
our capital looks a little bit more like Minnesota. And I think that that matters where people can see themselves reflected um, in their government and know that there are folks with lived experience who are fighting for this. And our coalition simply keeps getting um, larger. Uh, and I think it helps when you have more caregivers who are elected to office. Um, uh, having those personal stories, being able to talk from a, a position of real authority and your own lived experience, uh, I think is, is a game changer. And I also think that, um, and I think we'll talk more about this a little later on, but that there are folks who are caregivers who are now serving in office, who are responsible for caring for their own children, as well as their aging parents. Um, and uh, I think that that is making a difference in how quickly um, uh, this, is, this is moving uh, this session. But, you know, there was so, so much richness in, in uh, what you just said. I want to pull out a couple of threads um, in particular. One is um, your mention of business. And I, I, um, I, I am struck by the fact that you have this really interesting coalition of, of businesses that you hear from um, who say this is important. Um, and the other thing you talked about is kids um, and children and really drawing upon your own background and experience. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the benefits of paid leave from sort of a children and youth perspective, because I, I do think um, it is important to have a sort of a more holistic understanding of why paid leave is a, an important kids issue. Absolutely. So so paid family medical leave isn't a nice to have. I think it is a must have as we are talking about what is needed and necessary for the healthy development um, of our children. And as we talk about the need, um, certainly we have a, a need to close gaps here in Minnesota. Um, this is one of those foundational policies of making sure that uh, parents can bond with their children. Um, you know, coming from uh, the Native community, I'm a member of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe. One of the things that we talk about a lot is the first 1,000 days of a child's life. And we know that brain development um, is the critical time for brain development. It improves um, when uh, that child has time to, um, to bond with their caregiver and with their parent. Um, birth outcomes uh, in the first year of life, our, our development outcomes are, are much better. Um, maternal health is better when we have that opportunity. And, and for us, we've been really laser focused on Black and Native maternal health, where we have some of the largest disparities um, in, the, in the country, knowing that this is part of that strategy to help to curve some of those, those, those uh, disparities here in our state. So it's, it is good for, for um, babies and for children and their long-term uh, development and overall brain health and growth. Um, and it's great for parents too um, uh, to make sure that they are also um, uh, having that time to bond can take a appropriate I think we don't talk about this enough especially you know the delivery of a child is a is a incredibly um it's an incredibly moving and powerful experience but there's a lot of you know it, trauma on the body we need that time to recover and you know I um if I may just tell you a quick story I was in community um at a local community center where I live and um, I heard a baby crying. And this was probably about five years ago. And I looked around, um, you know, as uh, at that sort of super sense <laughs> that we have, where is that coming from? And it was, I saw a minivan with a young child, like a, a tiny infant um, who was crying, who is in a carrier in the back seat. And I saw, um, I saw a man get off a ladder come down and take the child out and start um, feeding them. And I said, you know, I, I just checked in and I was like, is everything okay? And he said, I was like, you're not in trouble. And, and he said, um, my wife had to go back to work right away. She's a janitor. And so mm -hmm. I work as a contractor so I can take the baby with me. Mm -hmm. This is not 
how we should be raising our children. Um, and so I think of that man all the time um, as we are working to, you know, to, to fight for paid family and medical leave, knowing that clearly this child has a parent who loves them tremendously. Um, and that child and their parent deserve an opportunity to have that opportunity to bond um, and to do so in a safe and supportive environment, both for the you know short term and long term outcomes um, for for that child and their parent. Well, you know, it's um, that's that story was so helpful. And um, I think it hits on a couple of points that I wanted to explore with you. Um, one is that, you know, I often think about paid leave as an equity issue mm -hmm. and, you know, very much about leveling the playing field. So as you pointed out, folks who are in, you know, perhaps more elite jobs that already have access to these benefits, you know, that they are not sort of on a different playing field than folks who may be in the janitorial job or the another sort of low wage, uh, low paying job um, who don't have access to those benefits. And so, you know, I, um, Mara in your her introduction mentioned importantly that you are the highest ranking Native woman elected statewide executive in the country, um, which is an incredible um, a, accomplishment. Um, um, but of course, I know you would say that you want to be not just the only, but the first of many. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about why you think of paid leave as important from sort of more of a, a people of color perspective or from an equity perspective? Why is it important for indigenous communities to have access to paid leave? Sure. So, you know, I think um, in this particular issue, and, and I'm so grateful that we're having this conversation, that more conversations like this one are happening, um, because we don't often talk about the experience of um, other than maybe people offering lots of helpful advice when you are pregnant in the grocery store. <laughs> we don't, you know, have these conversations as much as we need to about pregnancy and birth and then caring for a child. Um, we have heard, uh, as we have gathered, um, in particular, Black and Native women together, um, have heard some pretty traumatic birth experiences and stories. Um, and I myself uh, needed to be a um, very aggressive advocate um, while I was uh, in labor with my daughter um, about what was appropriate and what was not and having our traditional medicines um, in the space and no, they weren't drugs and, you know, the things that we needed, you know, to keep um, uh, like her placenta, for, you know, my placenta, for example, and some of the rituals that we have, the umbilical cord. And I share that with you because I think it matters that in that moment, I was literally a child advocate. I was leading an organization, right, um, uh, for children. And yet still as a Native woman was not heard until I brought in an additional advocate into that space and into that room. And that is deeply connected to this issue of equity and paid family and medical leave, knowing that we believe Native women, we believe Black women, we believe people of color as they're in these particular situations, when they're talking about their own um, experience, what they are feeling, their levels of pain, how they want to have this birth, um, you know, and, and the outcomes that they, you know, that they want for themselves and, you know, and, and for their child. And so if it can happen to me, it can especially happen to some someone who maybe isn't as an aggressive an advocate for themselves um, in, in these spaces. So, you know, in health, in labor and employment, in nearly every aspect of our lives, we see these disparities. And so we know that Indigenous people, people of color, um, uh, are more likely to work in these low-wage jobs where they don't have access to paid family and medical leave, uh, meaning that they are more likely to have to choose between this, pay, you know, between a paycheck, right, and caring for their child, caring for themselves, caring for a sick loved one. And again, being in these generations where 
many of us are caregivers for our children and for our elders who also um, tend to more often all live together and in and in the same home. So paid family leave really gives that, you know, essential time off to recover, to heal and to bond. And I think when we talk about the strategies around closing some of these, these, these gaps, these equity gaps, that this is one of the most, I think, foundational things that we can do um, for, uh, for families and in particular for um, Native women, um, women of color, Black women, uh, to be able to, um, to, take that, to take that time. So paid family leave is about, you know, stability, economic stability, um, but it's it really is truly um, about equity so that everyone can thrive. And it's about getting back to these, um, I think, very traditional and historic ways that we have cared for ourselves and have cared for each other, taking that time to bond um, across communities. This is sort of, I think, only... Um, you know, a recent thing that we are now experiencing. Traditionally, we took that time with our babies. Traditionally, women would come together across the community to help lift up and care for these new parents and their babies. That has fallen away. And so I think paid family and medical leave is one of the ways that we get back to who we are as Indigenous women, who we are as women of color, um, who community is, as you know, for for the Black community as well. Like these have all these traditions and practices have always been with us. This policy allows us to get back to those ways that um, have proved for better outcomes for uh, for babies, for new children, um, and for those who care for them. It's um, you know, thank you for that. You know, as you were speaking, I was you know really reflecting on um, something you said earlier and really how we viewed care um, and caregivers. And I think so much of what you speak to, particularly from a women of color's perspective, is about, uh, you know, sort of promoting sort of the dignity and uh, sort of autonomy of women of color to care for their families the way that, you know, they often provide care to others, right? Okay. And, um, and so I, I thank you for that. I You know, one question I have for you, just, you know, given the work that you've done and the breadth of experience that you bring to this issue, what do you say to other, you know, states, other lawmakers who may be just thinking about this and, you know, worried about the cost or, you know, whether it's worth the investment? What, what would you say to somebody who came to you and said, you know, why do you think it's worth, you know, my state sort of looking into these issues? I mean, I would say when people are worried about the cost, we are already paying for not having it in place, right? When it comes to um, when it comes to maternal health, when it comes to child outcomes, um, I think we are already paying the cost. So doing this early, making this investment, and I think that there's lots of you know there are lots of um, paid family and medical leave uh, programs across the country. We have certainly. Uh, look to our friends in other states to figure out how to do this right and to do this well, um, you know, and and so I think there are ways that employers can contribute, there are ways that employees can contribute and that the state should be contributing. I think it makes your state competitive. I think people want to move there. They want to live there. It is something that we are looking for. And in Minnesota, we have the highest rate of um, uh, workforce participation of, of women in the country. And so if that is the case, then we need to also have policies that are matching that. I would encourage other states to, to look at that. Um, I believe in my heart it is the right and just thing to do to have a paid family and medical leave uh, policy in place for your state. Um, but if that doesn't move you, um, then I think really the you know the economics around this issue make you make these in investments on the front end. In the long term, you're going to be able to retain workers. Um, and you're going to be able to have better long-term outcomes for children who then become adolescents and then teenagers and then will be participating in the workforce. Strong foundation for, um, you know, brain development and growth and bonding is, uh, I think, one of the best investments that, that people can make. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more, obviously. And, you know, I think you're, you're, um, 
uh, comments are very in line with what we've seen internationally. Um, and, and I think, as you point out in other states around women's labor force participation um, in particular, I know, um, I, you know, truthfully, I could talk to you all day, uh, <laughs> but I know I, I wanna be respectful of our time. I, I will ask you one quick uh, uh, final question. Um, and you said something you said earlier about um, the, the change in your, the composition of your legislation legislature, and maybe that would also uh, lead to change. You know, one of the things that I've always been struck by is that in the public, this is not necessarily a Democratic issue or, or a Republican issue like everybody wants it. And, and, and I wonder if you experience the same thing when you get outside of the politics of it. Do you get the sense that, you know, there is this momentum across many different constituencies about just the importance of paid leave for themselves and their families? Absolutely. I think I think when you take the politics out of it, because I think, frankly, the conversations that are happening in the legislature aren't always the conversations that uh, people are having outside of the Capitol. Um, what we have found from the research that's been done is that paid family and medical leave um, is uh, has incredible support across party lines. Um, and, and so I think that this is something that uh, that once you start to have these conversations with people about their experience, why it matters, you can start, you know, to break down some of those those walls. And I have had some pretty powerful conversations with women who are on the other side of the aisle for myself, um, who I think will come on over when, um, you know, when this, this bill uh, comes before them, because um, they know how incredibly important it is. So as our legislators, um, legislatures, our leaders in power begin um, to look more like the communities that they seek to represent, I think it's good for democracy. I think we get better results. And both in, you know, the governor and I support this, we also have the, you know, our, our majority leader uh, is a, is a, is a woman, our speaker of the house is a woman. I think that matters and having women in these leadership positions, we get it and are going to fight for the policies that we know are good for our families and good for our state overall. Um, that's a great place for us to end our discussion. Um, I, I want to thank you just for all of the work that you are doing. It is so important and your leadership, not only in the state of Minnesota, but also just what it signifies for the rest of the country. Thank you so much. And um, I wish you um, all the luck in the work. Uh, I know you won't need it because I, I think you got it. But uh, but in, in, in support of all of that, I hope uh, that you are able to take that next step with paid family and medical leave. So thank you again, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan uh, for, for all of the work that you're doing. Um, and now I really have a, the distinct pleasure of handing uh, the, the virtual mic over to Molly Weston Williamson. She is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Uh, before her current role, Molly was director of paid leave and the future of work at a better, better balance. And she is truly one of the country's foremost experts on paid family leave. Um, she is going to moderate a discussion with two leaders in states who are in, doing great work on this issue you and in from Virginia and New Mexico. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say about the state of paid leave and, and momentum and building and support of paid leave. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Molly. Thank you, Jocelyn, um, for that kind introduction. Um, thank you again to the Lieutenant Governor. I think, um, as you said, when our legislatures start to have more women, start to look more like our communities, we get great progress. And I think we've got three fantastic examples of that right here on this panel. Um, before we jump in, just one housekeeping note. Um, we are looking forward to taking questions from the audience um, for this panel. If you can just throw those in the Q&A function, those will get them um, over to us since the other functions are disabled. Um, so with no further ado, I'd love to introduce our three panelists. Um, first, State Senator Jennifer Boisco has served in the Virginia legislature since 2016, first in the House of Delegates, and now representing the 33rd District in the Virginia Senate. She's a career public servant and a longtime leader on issues from broadband access to expanding Medicaid to renewable energy. And especially relevant for today's conversation, she's the lead patron of Virginia's paid family and medical leave bill, 
which she just recently successfully led to passage through the Virginia Senate, which we'll be asking her many more questions about in just a moment. Next, we have State Representative Linda Serrato, who represents House District 45 in New Mexico. She's a longtime organizer and advocate who has fought for working families at the state and national level her entire career. Especially relevant today, she's a leader in the fight to pass paid family leave in New Mexico, which is in a race with Minnesota and a couple of other states to become the 12th state to guarantee paid family and medical leave to workers in the state. And last but not least, um, we have with us Gail Bolden, Deputy Director of the Women's Bureau at the Department of Labor. Gail is a national leader on paid leave, both in her current role and in her former roles as an advocate and as a state senator in Rhode Island. As a state senator, she was the primary sponsor on 40 bills that became law, including successfully championing Rhode Island's groundbreaking paid family leave law, which has now been paying benefits to workers for many years. So we're delighted to welcome all of our panelists today and to really tap into your wealth of expertise. Um, to start things off, um, we'd love to hear from each of our panelists about why paid leave is important to you. And since I realize we may not be in the same order um, on each other's screens, uh, I'm going to ask Representative Serrato and then Senator Boisco and then Deputy Director Golden to speak. Great, thank you. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction. It's good to see um, so many folks interested in this. Um, I always cared about paid leave. You know, I grew up in a union household and I knew that a lot of these benefits were, you know, just kind of automatic where I was from, but it really came to light uh, with the pregnancy of my my first when I um, the, I was in California originally and the job that I had provided paid leave under California law. And then I asked at the time, I said, you know, what happens if I move? You know, what happens if that shifts? And it was a small organization. They said, well, you know, um, we'll, we'll respect what we've already said, but we'll, we'll talk about it later. We'll deal about it later. Sure enough, I moved. Sure enough, I got pregnant. And sure enough, that was not honored. And so the first thing I did was look for another job. And I found one that was able to, you know, work with me. And so immediately they lost someone who had been, you know, a steady worker who had been with that organization for about three years by that point. And, you know, that's what happened with my second, I was at a small nonprofit and I'll end here. Um, and, uh, but I, with my second and they, they really scraped together enough so that I could take off three weeks and I had a C-section and, you know, that three weeks was critical for healing. It was of course not enough, but I mean, a huge difference in your ability to move around and live. And they, it literally cost them at least $5,000 to, to be able to provide that for me. And so when you look at it from my perspective as a worker who wants to stay and continue to contribute, when you look at it from the perspective of a business that's, you know, trying to do the best by their, 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 their employees, it, it just really illuminated why paid family leave was so important for me and for our state. Yeah. Well, hi, it's good to be with you all. Molly, it's nice to see you virtually. I feel like we're communicating so often this session. Um, my personal story, I when I was having my second child, I ended up getting a, one of the very rare preeclampsia diseases called the HELP syndrome, which basically I was about to die. Um, we were forced to give birth to our child six, uh, eight weeks early, and she was in the NIC unit for six weeks. My husband, who was working full time and I was the stay at home mom, only had two weeks to take off. Um, we were we were living paycheck to paycheck at that point. And so I had a toddler at home to care for. I wasn't really in good shape for driving yet. And my baby was 20 miles away in the NIC unit. And we don't have any family who lives near. Um, it was very, very difficult for us. Secondly, I, um, in 2009, um, I had some problems with my voice. I, I uh, ended up losing it for the better part of nine months. And I was working for another elected official where my job was to be out in the community and talking to people. I was forced to take unpaid leave for two full months because it, I was in very big risk of completely losing all access to permanent damage to my, my voice. And, um, and again, we, you know, my County didn't have access to paid family medical leave. So I was forced to go without a paycheck for two months. I know, you know, that there are families all over Virginia and all over the United States who are struggling with those problems at the, sitting at their kitchen table, tr trying to figure out, do we pay our bills or do we say goodbye to our loved one? You know, these are these are decisions that people shouldn't have to make. They don't have to make them in other countries because they all care have policies that allow families to care with dignity 
for their themselves and their loved ones. And I think it's time for us to do that here in Virginia and in the, you know, in the entire nation. Appreciate you all having me on today. Um, it is so great to be with all of you here today and hear all of your stories as well. Um, you know, my advocacy started with my own life experience in 2001. I had two events in one year. One was that I um, was standing on a balcony in a house and the balcony collapsed and I fell 16 feet and broke my back. And I also became a mom in that year. And so I had the experience of both needing to care for myself, have somebody care for me, and also to care for um, a child in our home. And all of that made me realize um, how many gaps we have in our public policies that made that far more challenging than it needed to be while I was already going through my uh, I am Canadian by birth and that experience happened alongside the same time as one of my sisters who uh, still lives in Canada um, was both caretaking for me and also became a mom in that year. And the difference in the policy experiences we had and the trajectories of our lives based on her access to paid leave and without mine really made me realize that it was time to get involved. Uh, and so I started organizing and eventually ran for office to make that a reality in Rhode Island. Thank you so much to all of you. And I think one of the things that we we find so much over and over again in paid leave world is everyone's got a story. Everyone's got a story about the time they either had the leave and protections they needed or time when they didn't and it really mattered. Um, so Representative Serrato, um, as we've alluded to, paid leave legislation you've championed is really at the forefront in New Mexico right now. Um, could you talk to us about what it took to get to this place in New Mexico? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think there's a few pieces that we had to look at really closely. And what we decided to do was form a task force. And we brought out our Department of Workforce Solutions, which is um, our employment uh, division. We brought out our economic uh, development. We brought forward businesses, um, businesses that business organizations that we knew fiercely opposed this. Um, we brought forth, you know, labor organizations, just a real mix of interests that could contribute to that conversation of what we could do to um, pass paid leave. Um, we are midway through a session, you know, you never know <laughs> how things are going and you want to keep working. But I will say the conversations, you know, have been more positive than I than they than I've heard them be in the past. You know, my constituency loves paid family leave. They told me that at the doors from the beginning. And you know, it's very strong in my district. So I always felt comfortable running on it. And so when we what we did was at that task force, we, we put it all on the table. We heard what everyone needed to make it work. Um the business, one of the business coalitions put together seven things that they needed to requirements to be hit. We were able to hit five of them. So that's, you know, we, we take those benefits when we can. Um, and, you know, even talking with everyone, uh, I think that really did make it, you know, bringing everyone to the table is a big difference. Uh, I believe you said it earlier, like the lieutenant governor said, we are a majority female house in, in New Mexico. Uh, we are a majority f uh, people of color state and our, our legislature reflects that as well. And so I believe those, you know, understandings of those experiences help. Um, you know, I will say that it's been easier for me to talk about paid family leave here because I was very pregnant during last session. So everyone knew. I was going to have a baby and everyone was not surprised when I was back on this bill. So a lot of those conversations we were having along the way. The last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, for us, the initial investment in the fund or in the trust or, you know, insurance fund, but it's it's a fund for us, um, would will be repaid over six years and how we calculated it. And that's a huge help too. We're still navigating it through the budgetary process. Um, but even then, that makes it a lot easier to make the argument of saying, hey, put $36 million into this idea is when you can say it actually comes right back. Those are, I think, pieces that made a big difference. Thank you. I think building on exactly that momentum, um, Senator Boisco, um, as we alluded to, your paid leave legislation just passed the Virginia Senate, which I know was a long time labor of love um, on your part. Virginia is a little different than some of the states we've seen already pass paid leave. It's a state that has divided government. It's a state in the South. Um, could you talk to some about what it's been like to move forward paid leave in a state like Virginia? Absolutely, Molly. So I've carried this bill five years in a row since 2019 was the first year that we carried it. Um, and this was the first year that we got the Senate to, to pass it out of committee even um, and onto the floor where it passed in the Senate. 
just a few minutes ago, right before I came on, um, I presented it in the House of Delegates before their Commerce and Labor Subcommittee. Um, they gave me one minute to explain the bill, refused to give us any opportunity for witnesses to speak because they had already killed the House version. This was the first year we got a House patron to um, carry the same legislation, um, and it was obviously unsuccessful. Um, Virginia has been a really big challenge because folks do not believe that mandating any sort of a of a benefit is of benefit for some reason. Um, and there has been an enormous amount of education. We have done, we've done a study, we've done an actuarial study, we've done an implementation study. We have looked at all corners of the universe, making sure that this is something that makes sense for the Commonwealth, makes financial sense for businesses and individuals. Yet we still have resistance because I think folks are uh, very hesitant to take on any sort of a new program. We just last year passed legislation, and I was happy to co-patron, that would allow um, a private insurance policy to be created. Um, as of now, there are no policies um, that have been taken up. I understand that someone has just applied to, to create one, but it has not exactly been a robust um, um, adoption. Um, and so we'll just continue talking, but we are changing, you know, the legislature has changed, has, has become more diverse. And I expect that that's just going to continue to happen in 2023 when we have our elections again. Thank you, Senator Boisco. Uh, I'm going to take a, a chance to remind folks to keep throwing questions, um, into the Q and A panel. We're excited to hear from our audience. Um, so Deputy Director Golden, you were one of the first state legislators to pass, uh, successfully pass a paid family leave policy, um, which has now been benefiting workers across Rhode Island for many, many years. Can you talk a little bit about what has changed um, since you passed temporary caregiver insurance in Rhode Island and what stayed the same? Yeah, sure. So uh, Rhode Island, uh, when I championed that legislation, what I really did was look back at the experiences that had happened in California, New Jersey, and thought, you know, how can I learn from their legislative actions and the way they implemented their policies to make sure I was improving upon it, um, building on that foundation and growing it. And so Rhode Island was the third state to create paid family leave and the first state to do so with uh, uh, to create job protected leave on paid family leave. And so that meant that people no longer had to worry about taking the time off and getting fired from being able to use those few weeks of paid family leave. Since then, we have seen that um, really become integrated into many of the state laws moving forward. And so that was where we started. And we can see where it's, you know, that that has become something that people have really learned from and built upon going forward. I think as the Lieutenant Governor had said, Previously, just a little bit earlier, she said, you know, people think that think about paid leave being nice to have, but actually it's a must have. And in my mind, I feel like when I started this advocacy many years ago, people were really focused on if we really needed it. And now this is a conversation of when is it going to happen and what will it look like? I think one of the things that hasn't changed, aside from the actual need for paid leave um, across this country, is that commitment to very solid principles that make sure that the policies that we have in the states and um, across this nation really get at the heart of equity and make sure that we keep who needs paid leave the most centered in what those policies will look like. So we know from looking at the state programs what works and what's good public policy. Uh, and I think that that has given us, the past 20 years has given us a an amount of time to learn those lessons and since to see the research and know what's effective. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I think for um, really any of our, our panelists, as we look forward to taking some questions from the audience, um, would you like to share some of what some of the challenges have been? I think Senator Boisco has talked about some of um, the challenges that um, she's faced in Virginia, but I'm curious to hear from you as folks who 
uh, are at all different steps along the process of winning paid leave uh, in your respective states, what some of the, the challenges and difficulties have been. So any of you feel free to jump in. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in a little bit. You know, we, you're now, it's like anything, right? You're navigating in our, in our state to House committees, the House floor, to Senate committees, the Senate floor, the governor's office. And so really it's, um, it's like, it's definitely, uh, I saw this me, a gif of somebody trying to line up cats, right? And each one keeps moving. And that's, yeah, I think that's definitely what happens a lot. And so, you know, there are people who are chairs that you have to review the language with again and make sure. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of those steps you kind of have to take one step forward, two steps back, two, you know, two steps forward, one step back. You you keep pushing um, is what it comes down to. Um, I think it's been also a lot of education. You know, I know um, Senator Boisco uh, also mentioned she's running for five years. My colleagues and I have been on this, this recent version for a couple of years now. Um, you know, you just have to to keep using those as opportunities to educate. So one of the some one of the groups did a poll and it was something like 79% of New Mexicans support paid family leave. And so I mean again, these are pieces um and you also get a keener eye, I think, is you know, that happens along that. These are pieces that you tell people that, that add in. And then you have people that come forward and say, well, this is a new issue I've never had before. But since you've been doing this for a few years, you say, you know, that's that doesn't, that's that's not a thing. Or that is a thing, and we will consider it. But after you've been honing this in for so long, you know, you you have to keep lining up the cats, you know, <laughs> lining them up again and again. Thank you. I, I now I'm never gonna lose that image of lining up the cats. Um, Senator Boisco, Deputy Director Golden, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I can just add, I think getting getting members' heads wrapped around the fact that this is actually a better policy for businesses than what they're doing now, spending $2.50, basically the cost of a cup of coffee each week versus $5,000 for the out-of-pocket cost for for somebody to take two months, three months off. Like they, they, they can't seem to wrap their heads around the math and believe that this is actually something that's going to end up being a cash positive um, uh, policy for them. And I, I guess it will continue to be conversations and education over and over and over again, as we've been doing for five years. I think one of the things um, that I would also add in is that, you know, People often don't realize they need paid family and medical leave until they need an experience, they have an experience when they need it. So it's, you know, it's kind of think about parental leave, but then it doesn't really, it, until they have a heart attack or break a leg or, you know, their mom ends up in the hospital, it doesn't really um, come to the forefront how many gaps we have in our public policies that make that a little bit harder to manage those crisis moments. And so I think it's it's partially that I, I really think that has shifted in the past 20 years, that more and more people understand that, and it's more of our cultural understanding about the need for paid leave. But it really hits home when you have the experience yourself, um, and anyone can have the experience. So I think it's really taking that moment and putting that all together into those conversations. Thank you for that. I think exactly to that point, um, every one of us at some point in our lives is going to need leave. And one of the things that I think is often striking to folks is that what we know from usage of the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, what we know from the experience of states that already have paid leave programs, is that what most people use paid leave for is their own serious health needs. It's actually mostly not caregiving, mostly not parental, not because those aren't important, particularly as a mom whose kids will probably bust into this room at some point in this presentation, um, but because any of us can get cancer, any of us can need surgery, any of us can. And I think the more that we understand that this is a universal need, the more we understand there's a need for a universal solution. Um, and with that, I am thrilled to start moving into um, some of the questions that we're getting from our audience. Um, one question we're getting is, um, we know that some of the challenges in existing states have been around how we make policies inclusive and make sure that they really reach um, all of the folks who need them. So for any of our panelists, um, how can we make sure that policies moving forward are inclusive and how are you working on that in your own states? I'm 
happy to talk about some of the ways that we know public policy uh, paid leave becomes more inclusive. You know, we know that programs that are social insurance that cover everybody, all workers, um, really are meeting the need. Right now, uh, there is a huge need. Many people do not have paid leave through their employer. And if you look at low-wage workers, uh, workers of color, and, and particularly women and women workers of color, um, they are the least likely to be able to have access to paid family leave so through their employer. So it's really important that those policies have broad social insurance and eligibility so they bring in as many workers as possible into the pool. I think what we have seen across the states have been um, uh, efforts to address the amount of wage replacement. The, you know, Rhode Island is one of the states that had a temporary disability insurance historically. And so the amount of wage replacement was really tied to a program that had started in 1942. But as the newer states have come on, they have expanded um, what wage wages get replaced. And so people get more money if they are lower wage earners, more more percent of their wages are replaced if they need to take that time off. And that has helped with the um, ensuring that there is more equity in who's able to use it as well. Um, I think one of the things that also we think a lot about is that uh, is not allowing the uh, to be restrictive in who you can care give for because families come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes and people love all different kinds of people and we need to be able to make sure that caregiving can happen for every one of your loved ones without that being defined by the state. Thank you. Um, do either of our other panelists want to talk about how you've been um, focusing on inclusivity? Sure. I mean, one of the things I've, I've carried this bill for five years, and one reason that I have not watered it down is because of the inclusivity factor. We know that to have a universal program will make it affordable. Again, like for a person who makes $60,000, they would be responsible for paying about $2.64 a week. Um, that will not happen if we have a private insurance pool only or only applying to a certain level of workers. And so it, it's been really important to us, the stakeholders that I work with, that we maintain like the most broad group of people possible so that we can help people who are custodians and contract workers, just like what you've talked about, people who are working for themselves and making sure that they're included in this pool. I, I apologize, Molly. Every time you get to the last word of that question, I can't hear it. So sorry. Could you say it again? I apologize. Um, how are you focusing on making sure New Mexico's policy is inclusive of all workers? Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, what we were able to do is one of the the um, agreements we came to with the business community was that we the the, pro the proposal we have essentially has both employees and employers put into the fund uh, with slightly more coming from the employees. And one of the agreements we came to was that we exempted um, businesses that had five or less employees from having to put into the fund. They'd still have to honor an employee's request for paid family leave and their employees would still have to put into the fund. Um, we were able to make that sol like solvent and fine um, and that ended up excluding two thirds of the businesses in New Mexico. So it was a big, it, you know, in, in many ways it's a big concession, um, but it's but it's really not because you still have a number of people still putting into to, um, to the, the community. So, you know, again, we, finding ways that we can compromise without compromising the essential values. Um, the one thing we've shifted from what from earlier um, pieces had was that we included that you could use paid family leave for um, domestic violence um, victims and their families or survivors. Um, and we've discussed this as a workplace safety issue, because when you look at workplace violence that typically is tied to, um, you know, restraining orders or recent uh, domestic violence um, events. So for that, and we were able to discuss it from, you know, this, this community sense. And that when we added that in that was less no no one even batted an eye it just made sense that that was what we were going to do next and la i'm sorry last thing i will say is that we've been really working on bringing in new allies i think that's one thing too um, i'm the vice chair of commerce and economic development our chairwoman you know also believes this is a priority when she hasn't really spoken about this before so again bringing in as many allies as we can thank you and i think that leads into another question that we've um, been hearing from the audience which is we know that paid leave pulls 
astronomically through the roof with every kind of cross section of the population you can pick. And yet we also know that we don't have universal paid leave in this country yet. Um, so I'm curious if any of our panelists can speak about who are the opponents, who is opposing um, paid leave and what are the conversations you're having about um, how do we bring some more folks into the fold? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy to kick on this one. Um, so in our state, we just have folks that um, just don't want any more regulations on 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 businesses, just none. So anything that would be a, a requirement, a mandate to participate, even though, it, I mean, for a small business, it's an economies of scale issue, right? Like you can't grow to be the size that you need to be to offer this kind of um, um, benefit to keep your workforce, which was what we're direly needing. It doesn't matter. You have to um, not re require less and not more mandates on our state. Um, I think that's where most of them come from. And then honestly, what I, I hear more than anything else is just misinformation and confusion about what the bill would actually do. Um, and so people are saying, well, this means I would just never hire a woman again. It's like, well, no, it's not just for people that may become pregnant. It's for everyone, you know, so. Yeah, I think I think the misinformation and the, the confusion is a really big piece of it. When you really sit down and, and go through the bill, it's hard for anybody to 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 argue with it. And when we talk about the fact that all of us have these events in our lives, whether it's bringing a baby into the home, whether it's caring for a dying parent, whether it's caring for ourselves or for a child who might have cancer or a spouse who might have cancer or a loved one, everybody has those problems. And the, the understanding that economically to be able to plan for these challenges instead of just reacting to them is continues to be a hard nut to crack. Um, but I am optimistic that as we continue to have conversations, I just I was just being interviewed by by one of the big business leaders here who told me that his daughters live one of one of them lives in Maryland. She's off on her maternity leave because they just passed paid family medical leave in in Maryland. And then talking about that, they also he had a daughter who was caring for her elderly grandparent again. And this is somebody who has been violently, you know, vehemently opposed to the policy in Virginia in the past, but it seems that it's starting to take shape a little bit. I remain optimistic that we're gonna get there and uh, conversations like this, I think are helpful. Thank you so much. And I think that is an ideal moment um, to start wrapping up our conversation because I think we're optimistic too. And I think we're optimistic, not only because we know how much this matters, um, but because we've seen it in action, we've seen the Virginia Senate pass this, we've seen Rhode Island pass this, we've seen state after state um, stepping it up. So I think at this point, um, we're operating on optimism, but we're also operating on evidence. Um, and we're excited to see that um, spread to more folks. So I want to take this moment on behalf of the Center for American Progress and the National Partnership for Women and Families to thank all of our panelists who are here um, with us right now to thank Jocelyn Fry and uh, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan for joining us for a really wonderful and enriching conversation. Um, again, we'll look forward to continuing um, to work with all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and you can find more information about upcoming events and additional resources um, on our website. So thank you all for a wonderful conversation and have a great afternoon. <laughs>